welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. We're looking at the tide that has turned in eastern Congo uh, after the M23 rebels, the Tutsi-led M23 rebels, uh, have been pushed out, not pushed out, claim the rebels. They say that they instead are opting for the negotiating table. Not so, says government forces. With us to talk about it from Berlin, uh, Simon uh, Schlinwein, Great Lakes correspondent uh, for German newspaper TAZ, General Dominique Trincan, uh, a uh, former uh, head of uh, UN peacekeeping operations on several uh, fronts. Douglas Yates teaches at the American University of Paris from the Normandy town of Pervencher, Congolese journalist and blogger Cédric Calangy. And we can welcome to the discussion staff writer at The New Yorker, Philip Gorovich, author of uh, We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Family's Stories from Rwanda. Uh, Philip, in part one of our discussion, everyone playing it cautious on this end about whether or not the tide really has turned. Your thoughts on that? Uh, caution seems very wise. I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, there's uh, many, many. This I think that really what has happened is we're now at a moment where the claims that have been made over the years that Rwanda is the sole problem in Congo uh, will be put to the test. Uh, whatever the uh, claims can be made about now having removed M23, having removed uh, the allegations, which Rwanda always denied, of uh, uh, Rwandan meddling. Um, the, all the causes underlying this conflict, all the other parties remain. And the good faith of the uh, Congolese government, uh, which has not always been in evidence in the last uh, several, uh, well, half century, um, and, uh, and of the United Nations, whose uh, role in the region has almost always created at least as uh, large problems as it was sent to solve. Um, both of those seem to me to be now very much um, in the hot seat. They have to get rid of the FDLR. They have to get rid of a whole lot of other armed groups. They have to uh, protect the uh, population, uh, which neither the Army nor the UN has been good at doing uh, in the last uh, decade or more. And uh, they have to really address, I think, uh, some of the big, big underlying issues of land and citizenship uh, underlying this conflict. Since before the Rwandan genocide in North Kivu, the areas that were most at the core of the M23 conflict have been for half a century now uh, inflamed by questions of whether or not uh, Congo will recognize uh, the ancestral residents of Rwanda phone, Tutsi, particularly Tutsi, but not only origin, as Congolese citizens. And that question has been left wide open. And until it's resolved, uh, it will be a cause for violence, grief, and, uh, and all sorts of political disorder. Cédric Calonji, do you see that issue being brought to the fore now? Do you see uh, the authorities in Kinshasa going to the negotiating table with their neighbors? Right now, those talks uh, that are being brokered by Uganda seem to kind of be on standby, and also addressing some of those hugely important citizenship and land reform issues in the east of Congo. I think it's the only one, only one way to, for, for, to, to, to achieve the peace in, in the eastern Congo, uh, because uh, there are FDLR from Rwanda in Congo. There are also other... Yeah, just to explain, uh, the, the FPLR, just to explain to people, th those are the offshoots of... Uh, uh, some of the Hutus who took part in the 1994 there genocide. Hutu, Hutu rebels accused by Kigali uh, uh, for genocide of 1994. Uh, and they are in Congo, they, are, uh, they have uh, uh, weapons, and there are two, there are two um, uh, what can I say that? Uh, they, are, they are key players in the illegal trafficking of minerals in the eastern Congo. Uh, uh, and... Uh, Congolese officer too. I think the solution um, to uh, Congolese problem is is um, uh, can I say that uh, the solution will be will be will be found by the three countries together. The three countries being uh, uh, DR Congo, Uganda, DR Congo, and Rwanda. Rwanda and Uganda. Right. They and have to talk. They have to find a solution about all the group, all the rebel groups, and then Rwanda and Uganda uh, uh, will be will be um, um, 
the, the solution for, for their group is to negotiate with FDLR and the other one. And, and right now, Rwanda don't want to negotiate with FDLR, and uh, it's the same problem with Uganda, with the uh, rebel group Uganda and rebel group in Congo. They, want, they don't want to negotiate. Which, and, which brings me back to what which brings me back to what you were saying at the outset there, Philip Gorovich. Uh, you were mentioning how Rwanda has been in the hot seat the last, and we've seen a reduction of aid to Rwanda on the part of uh, the UK, the United States, and the European Union. Um, is there a direct link between that reduction in aid and uh, the events we've seen the last couple of weeks in eastern Congo? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I mean, that's certainly what everybody uh, is, is, is claiming. Uh, certainly the people who reduced the aid and lobbied for the aid are saying, you see, we affected that. Now, of course, Rwanda has denied from the beginning that it was there. So they were claiming Rwanda was what made M23 strong, and the withdrawal of Rwanda was what made M23 weak. And in that narrative, the fact that this was actually a war fought by French commanders through troops from South Africa, Zim, uh, Tanzania and Malawi, and that, and that you also had a deep uh, split within the M23 and it had weakened massively internally already, means that there are many, many factors there. Um, I don't think that uh, you can subtract the aid, but I don't think that's all there is to it. And I also don't think Rwanda would be sitting on the sidelines if Rwanda perceived what's happened in the last few weeks as an existential threat. I think they're in a stronger diplomatic position than they were when M23 was uh, out there and being blamed on them entirely. I think they're actually in a better position right now than they were even a week ago uh, diplomatically. I think the Tutsis of Eastern Congo are probably not in a better position. Uh, whether or not M23 was protecting them, I think they're very exposed and they don't have any clear uh, political or military representation. But I would just make one point, which is on the question of negotiating with the FDLR rebels, Rwanda has been negotiating with them for over 15 years and has been constantly repatriating and reintegrating them if they surrender uh, their military cause. What they want is to be reintegrated as a cohesive opposition force inside Rwanda politically. And Rwanda has not agreed to that. Um, and that is partly because the very top leaders are, in fact, accused of uh, the ones who remain but they're, uh, of being in the genocide. But there are constantly uh, hundreds and thousands, hundreds a month and thousands a year of FDLR fighters who are going back to Rwanda. They go through a U.N. World Bank program. They are reintegrated into life in Rwanda. They are, if they are accused of genocide crimes in Rwanda, they're held to account, which means that those who really, really have that to fear are less likely to go home. But the commander of Rwanda's prisons, a brigadier general, was the commander of the FDLR during some of its most potent period. So it's not right to say that Rwanda simply won't have them home. Let me ask uh, Simon Schlinwein. Do you agree with Philip Gorovich that uh, Rwanda, in fact, probably has a stronger hand right now than it did uh, a few months back? Yes, definitely. But we saw actually the proof that Rwanda is right now, for this moment, not supporting the M23. And I guess that was proven, so they had been uh, defeated uh, right now. So. This makes Rwanda much more clear in their perspective. We have done our steps, which you, the international community, ask us for. So you, the international community, and the Congolese government, you have to do your steps right now. And this is how to do to deal with the FDLR, the next step, the enemy number one of the Rwandan government. So uh, now they are in this kind of. They played now the ball into the side of the Congolese government's uh, part to play their steps now. And it makes them very strong in insisting to say, look, we play, uh, we accepted our demands, so you accept ours. And this is much more difficult now to reach this next step than it was to just withdraw the aid to M23. And this is exactly how the government of Congo is now in these in, in ask for action, and this is much more complicated to reach that next step, I guess. And um, so Rwanda is a definitely the better position of uh, better off than before. In fact, you might say that the pressure is, in fact, uh, on uh, the Congolese government in a certain way. The U.S. special envoy for the region, Russ Feingold, says it's time for all armed groups to be stopped, um, including the FDLR. Here's what he had to say. 
they need to face accountability. They need to face justice. Uh, this is first and foremost uh, up to the nation of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And uh, that all of us, the international community and others, will do whatever they wish to assist them in the appropriate uh, procedure of bringing these individuals to justice, a proper prosecution and punishment for crimes. So, Cédric Kalonji, uh, will the uh, Congolese government now go after those Hutu militias? We have a, um, a, uh, an, a, a, an officer, a Colonel Amuli from the Army, who said it's something that's planned, that you have to plan. You can't just simply announce it. Just wait and see. The, the, the situation in the in the Eastern Congo. Be, before talking about about M M23, we talk about CNDP, and before we talk uh, too about RCD. But uh, they never found um, a sustainable solution for peace in the Eastern Congo. Right now, the the, the, uh, the enemy number one of of uh, the Congolese government is the M23. But what the next step? Uh, we will see uh, if. Uh, the FDLA, who is in some case um, um, uh, uh, Congolese army, uh, ah, how can I say, um, uh, they, they, they fight together against uh, 23 in certain time. And we will see if the Congolese gover government will have the determination to, to, to fight the, the, or to, 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 to de disarm the uh, FDLA uh, troops and or uh, any other uh, armed group like Mai Mai and other, other one. All right, and we have a question on Twitter. Um, will the M23 step down set the stage for peace among armed groups in Congo? And General Trinquant, uh, you just heard there a moment ago, Cédric mentioned the, that, that array, that daunting array of different militias that are there. And of course, we're talking about a vast expanse in the east of Congo. Yes, yeah, certainly. The problem of this region is this region is too rich. So when you are, you have got the control of different mines, coltan, uh, or different minerals, you are rich. So th this is where the government of Congo must put the pressure on this militia, integrating the people probably in security forces or something like that, and take control of his own resources. But uh, you're right. I mean, M23 is the well-known movement, but there are a lot of other movements, and the uh, Congolese governments have got to, to solve the problem with them. So if you're looking for a lasting solution, how do you go about it so that we don't have the reappearance, Douglas Yates, of these... Uh uh, of these groups that are the scramble for, for raw materials? Well, we've got two s elements of the solution already by, in a sense, getting Rwanda out and by giving the UN the ability to actually fight. But what are all these rebel movements opposed to? The government, which by all international standards is in place fraudulently, and the presence of conflict minerals, which are the prize. So as far as the government goes, for now, it's not on the international agenda to remove this government. So the rebels oppose this government. As long as this government's in place, by that I mean the government, the hereditary republic, uh, undemocratic republic of Congo, where you've got the son of a former dictator who is now a dictator. So as long as he's present, you're going to have rebellion against that. And the second are the conflict minerals. Best solution is to create some kind of process like we did with diamonds. Remember the blood diamonds debate. There's been a lot of talk to try to get some kind of certification process to explain how a country like Rwanda, which doesn't possess these minerals, becomes a major exporter. And besides Rwanda, Uganda as well. So this is, of course, our responsibility. Unlike diamonds, where you had one key actor, which was De Beers, unfortunately, with coltan, with gold, with these other minerals, we don't have a key actor in place with a monopoly. But the international community has done a lot of learning. There are proposals on the board. There is traceability of these elements. It's not scientifically impossible. So both changing the government, against which all of these rebellions are opposed, and getting some kind of certification process on the minerals will also contribute to the negative piece. Simon, uh, Simon Schlinwein, uh, uh, as General Trinquant would say, uh, it's a rich area. As long as it's rich, will there continue to be uh, instability and fighting in eastern Congo? 
I would not say that the richness and the minerals causes the conflict in the first place. I guess the conflict is caused by different political and ethnic and uh, land issues, and uh, the the mineral richness just finances this war and keeps it just going and uh, makes it much more longer and much more profitable to win it. And uh, on the other side, war itself in Congo makes much, much, much money. Uh, just look at the army. The army is just functioning when there is war. And then the, there is open uh, pipes for money into the army, and everybody can go around the world and shop for yeah, helicopters, for gun aircraft, guns, ships, and everything else. And then there is money flooding into the system, and it makes itself like a self product self perpetuating system in terms of as long as war, as long as the money flowing into the army, into the, the pockets as well of people inside the army. So the, it's not only the richness, it is like that the, this war keeps on going, um, like so, uh, financing itself and just keeps, in, keeps on going because there are so many in people and having interest and keep on, uh, keep on this war, continuing this war. Uh, yeah, so in, in, in the towns that have been freed uh, by the army, celebrations uh, tempered uh, by the experience of falling prey to all sides. I left Romangobo to escape the fighting between the government troops and the M23. When the M23 failed, we fled into the mountains, and the conflict followed us. Government planes bombarded the mountain. And even until now, they've been fighting in the hills. Last week, we were at home, and we saw a plane. The plane bombed us, so everyone decided to flee. The M23 arrived and shot at people. So we fled without taking anything from home with us. We left empty-handed. All right, so it's all very fresh in people's memories and the, 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 the memory also of uh, being bombarded by government forces. Now, earlier we spoke to one of our uh, citizen journalists that contributes to the France 24 Observer's uh, website. Um, he said that uh, he hasn't uh, been celebrating yet either. He is worried. We've changed his name uh, of this Goma residence for the purpose of the interview. He feels a bit threatened of being seen. We also asked him if his view of the United Nations had changed now. In a way, we're satisfied, but the population here is a bit wary of the UN, whose attitude is slightly ambiguous, since they are asking for a solution in both political and military terms. People here want a military solution to the conflict, but they are skeptical towards the UN when they ask the government to go to Kampala to negotiate a political solution with the M23 rebels. That's their reservation here. In the wider sense, people here in Goma have welcomed the UN's recent operations. All right, Philip Gorovich, you're in New York, where the United Nations is headquartered. Uh, there's the sense, listening to uh, to that observer in in Goma, that uh, the positive news in all this is at least the world is paying attention. I think that's the feeling, and uh, you know, the UN has not is not a new arrival in the Congolese scene. It has been the largest peacekeeping force in the UN system. So what was brought in was really this African um, force of aggressive, aggressive force um, intervention brigade that was introduced uh, with African troops, but under the UN command. It was actually put forward originally as an idea out of the Kampala talks, uh, if I understand it correctly, um, where it was going to be brought in as a sort of African force uh, independent of the UN, and then it was brought in and sort of merged into the UN, and um, with its equipment, with its, uh, I mean, there's never really been an army fighting against these rebel groups. There's been the Congolese army, and they've never had a single victory. Um, and so this is a, a, a decisive um, military capability being brought to bear behind them. 
but the question is what happens when they go? And I think that's why people aren't uh, celebrating. I mean, if, if the, the, the clips that you played earlier of people uh, being hit in all directions could have been recorded almost every uh, year or two for the last uh, almost 20 years now. And, um, and, and so people have the experience of not uh, being too hasty and assuming that things are settled. And, and these, these abiding issues, which is the total illegitimacy of the government, uh, which was brought up earlier uh, by Mr. Yates, I think that's overwhelmingly uh, important to understand that this, this crisis really began two years ago with the election uh, that Kabila stole or botched to the degree that nobody uh, could support it as a legitimate election. And the Western world then kind of came in and he said, look, I'll, I'll go after these ICC indicted guys I've integrated into my army. And then you had M23. And the idea was, we don't want to legitimate Kabila, but we don't want to get rid of him. So we'll support him in getting rid of this other problem. And I think now we're back to having to deal with the larger Congolese instability and the fact that you really have uh, a country the size of Western Europe, most of which is, is completely ungoverned by anything that resembles a modern state. Simon Schlenwein, uh, it's tragic to, to hear the, the, those words because you, you, you see that at the borders with uh, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo, there's always this, uh, this ferment of, uh, uh, of rebellion. Um, again, th this has been pitched in the, in, in the media as, uh, uh, as this story where uh, finally for once there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's victory. Uh, is, there, is there an opportunity here in the midst of all we've just heard? No, I would cl clearly say right now it's too early to celebrate anything. And to, uh, to say as well as something changing in Congo and there will be peace in the next years, it, it's also too early. We, we talk about 54 different militias. And there are some foreign militias. We spoke about Ugandans, Burundians, Rwandese. But there are also lots of Congolese militias. And these militias don't, they are not like M23, easy to, defeat, to, to fight with. These other militias, they don't have uniforms. They are like civilians, they're young kids, they are children, they are child soldiers who are running around with a, with a machete and a gun. The UN and the intervention brigade cannot just fight against civilians and say, let's kill them and let's bombard them with helicopters and military uh, aircraft. This will be a very much dangerous and much more challenging situation in the future. And this is just the first step on a long way. And the tunnel is long and the end inside, I would not say, is already visible. General Trancon, what is the future of that UN mission, which has been there uh, for what, nearly two decades now? I think in the East, exactly as it was said, we are a long way from the real peace and uh, we have discussed about the different factors to achieve peace in this part of the world. Uh, certainly, if the government of Congo, whatever is the government, currently we've got this government, is able to control the area, then there will be a change. And to control the area, we're talking about different militia from foreign country or from Congo. Uh, I insist that the fact is because the country is rich. So they are securing minerals and they are paid by these minerals. If the Congolese government take control of this area, it will receive taxes, it will pay the forces, the security forces, which will probably include part of this militia. And if these militia are paid by the Congolese government, they will be probably happy, better than being killed by the Congolese army. Cédric Kalanji, can you buy the peace? I think without rule of law in the Eastern Congo, the peace is just impossible. The situation in the Eastern Congo is due to chaotic governance. Uh, restore the rule of law will play a, a, a major um, a role to the return of, of, of the peace. But uh, because it's because uh, most uh, leaders, Congolese leaders in Kinshasa, um, are... Are, are dealing with um, with um, uh, mineral uh, mineral uh, traffickers, and I think when um, uh, the the the, um, the rule of, of um, impunity will leave, then we can 
we can expect uh, the, the, the back of the piece in the, the, that region. All right. It's what we are expecting and waiting for years. All right. The, our panel not very kind, it seems, uh, to uh, the government of uh, uh, of Mr. Kabila. We did invite uh, the government to to take part. They they uh, uh, unfortunately were unable to to be with us. I want to thank all of you for being with with us, uh, General Trincon, uh, Douglas Yates, uh, Simon Schlindwein in uh, Berlin, um, Philip Gorovich in New York, and Cédric Calangi in the Normandy town of Pervencher. Thank you for joining us here for the France 24 debate.